Now, as I've discussed, propositional logic constitutes a different kind of logical system compared to syllogistic logic. Compared to syllogistic logic, propositional logic provides precise definitions for sentences containing and, or, if, then, only if, and if and only if. Okay? It also captures much more of ordinary language than is possible with syllogistic logic. So here's an example of a sentence that syllogistic logic won't be able to handle in its complexity, cats or mammals or reptiles. Now notice how in this example, and I'm going to step into the frame, you might think that this is a categorical statement, um, which it is, okay? Um, however, it would be difficult to translate this kind of statement into a standard form categorical statement and retain the actual meaning of that statement. The reason why this is the case is that here you actually have mammals or reptiles as constituting what you might say is the predicate term. Okay, and usually for a standard form categorical statement, you can't have a disjunction okay, as a term. You can only have um, one category of things as a term. So syllogistic logic won't be able to handle this kind of statement as well as uh, propositional logic. And we'll see how propositional logic will be able to do so. Okay? In propositional logic, the terms are statements, complete sentences, rather than categories of things, plural nouns. So this is another difference between syllogistic logic and uh, propositional logic. For syllogistic logic, remember the terms, those things that we replaced with the capital variables were plural nouns, categories of things, um, cats, mammals, uh, things that fly, so on and so forth. However, in propositional logic, the most simplest element of propositional logic will be a complete sentence, okay? Specifically, they will be simple statements, okay? Also, unlike syllogistic logic, which contains only standard form A, E, I, and O type statements, propositional logic contains an unlimited number of complex statements, okay? And this has to do because we're not limited to only A, E, I, O standard forms categorical statements. We can actually use the tools of propositional logic to create very complex and complicated compound statements. Okay, And you'll see how this is done. Now, as we've discussed in lesson one, there are several different kinds of statements that logic deals with. Syllogistic logic deals specifically with categorical statements. However, other than categorical statements, we also have simple statements and compound statements. Now, simple statement is a sentence that asserts a proposition without the use of any logical operator. And what we mean by proposition here is not a statement, okay, because that would be redundant, but what we're saying is a proposition in this case, we're referring to a state of affairs, okay, something about the world, okay. So a simple statement is a sentence that asserts a proposition, something about the world, without the use of any what is called logical operators. And we'll talk about what logical operators are. Compound statements is a sentence that asserts a compound proposition with the use of at least one simple statement and at least one logical operator. Now let's look at some simple statements in ordinary language. We have one example, apples are red. Here's another one, Sally goes to Clemson University. Here's another one, you should always make sure that you have read the assigned readings before coming to class. Abortion is morally wrong. There are four days between Mondays and Saturdays. And pigs fly. Now notice that all of these are statements. They assert something about the way the world is. Furthermore, it's the case that they all have a truth value. Now, we might not know what the truth value of these statements are. However, regardless of whether or not we know the truth value, these are statements, so they have a truth value. For example, apples are red. Now, if this asserts that some apples are red, then it is true. If it asserts that all apples are red, then it is false. Notice that these are statements in ordinary language, so sometimes you'll have statements like apples are red, which are ambiguous in meaning. So it's your job to kind of figure out what the precise meaning of that statement is when you do a translation. Sally goes to Clemson University, that has a truth value, although we might not know whether or not it's true or false because we don't know who Sally is. 
You should always make sure that you have read the assigned readings before coming to class. Notice that this also has a truth value as well, and I'd say yes, it's definitely true. Abortion is morally wrong. This also is a statement, although it is making a moral assertion. However, regardless of whether or not it's making a moral assertion, it's still stating something about the way the world is, and it has a truth value. Now, we might disagree on what truth value this statement has. However, regardless of whether or not we disagree, let's say you think it's true, I think it's false, one of us is definitely wrong because there is a definite truth value to this statement. There are four days between Mondays and Saturdays, so this also asserts something about the way the world is, and this is actually a false statement. And finally, pigs fly, and this is a false statement as well. These are all simple statements because they lack what is referred to as a logical operator. And logical operators, which we'll get to, are identified by words like not, and, if, then, if, and only if. So because these statements lack those logical operators, these are simple statements. There are also compound statements in ordinary language. And what makes a compound statement a compound statement is that it is constituted by at least one simple statement and a logical operator. So one of the first and most simplest form of a compound statement in ordinary language that propositional logic will deal with is the negation. And here's an example of negation, apples are not red. Now this is a compound statement because it takes the simple statement apples are red and then adds to it the negation operator which is indicated by the word not. So the simple statement that makes this up is apples are red and the logical operator that's added to this is the negation which is indicated by the word not and so it becomes a compound statement, apples are not red. A next compound statement is a conjunction. A conjunction uses the logical operator that is associated with words like and, okay? And here is our example, apples are red and Sally goes to Clemson University. Now notice that this compound statement is actually constituted by two simple statements, apples are red, as well as Sally goes to Clemson University. And these two simple statements are brought together by the logical operator, which is indicated by the word and, okay? So here we have a conjunction. Next, we can have a disjunction. Other than using the word and, okay, we can also have a logical operator that's associated with the word or. And any statement that uses the word or is referred to as a disjunction. So apples are red or Sally goes to Clemson University is a disjunction, and this disjunction is constituted again by two simple statements. Apples are red is one of them, and Sally goes to Clemson University is the other simple statement. Now these two simple statements, unlike the conjunction, is brought together by the logical operator that is associated with the word or, and so it becomes a disjunction. Now with conjunctions and disjunctions, you can actually have many statements that constitute a conjunction or a disjunction. So you don't need just two, although you need at least two statements. You can have more than two, but you need at least two. Also you have conditional statements, and these are standard material conditional statements. Usually, a standard material conditional statement will be indicated by the phrase if then. If then work together, and they both indicate one logical operator. So anytime you see a statement that has if then as its main operator, this will be a conditional. Now the statement we have here is, if apples are red, then Sally goes to Clemson University. And notice that this statement as well is constituted by two simple statements. Apples are red makes what is referred to as the antecedent of the conditional, and Sally goes to Clemson University makes what is referred to as the consequent of the conditional. However, even if this statement, just like conjunctions and disjunctions, are constituted by more than one simple statement, the statement is one statement. It is one compound statement. So you never want to split conditional statements into its individual part because then what you're doing is you're making up incomplete statements. Like you would never say, if apples are red. 
that's an incomplete statement, okay? So you never want to split a conditional statement. Finally, we have a biconditional. And a biconditional uses the logical operator that is associated with the phrase if and only if. And here's our example, apples are red, if and only if Sally goes to Clemson University. Now again, here we have two simple statements that make up this biconditional statement along with the use of the logical operator which is indicated by if and only if. So apples are red if and only if Sally goes to Clemson University. However, this statement again is only one statement. Just because it's made up of more than one statement doesn't make it more than one statement. It's made up of simpler statements, but it is only one conditional statement, which is a compound statement. So these are the kinds of statements in ordinary language that propositional logic will be able to handle. And these are simple versions of compound statements. Later on, we'll see how we can actually get more complex compound statements by adding more statements to build up even larger compound complex statements. So propositional logic constitutes what you might say a language of its own, okay? So we're going to translate ordinary language into the language of propositional logic. As with any other type of language, you're going to have certain parts or features or components of that language. Just like with English, we have letters and we have words and we have grammar, you have similar things in propositional logic. So the components of propositional logic, one of them is the propositional variable. A propositional variable is a capital letter of the alphabet and is used to represent a specific term in propositional logic. A single term is always a simple statement. Once a variable for a specific simple statement, which is a term, has been assigned, that variable will always represent the specific simple statement that has been assigned to it in a given passage. So this is similar with syllogistic logic, where we replace terms in syllogistic logic, which were plural nouns, with capital letters A, B, C, D. However, in propositional logic, rather than replacing plural nouns with variables A, B, C, D, what we'll be doing is replacing entire simple statements with the variables A, B, C, D. Next, we have logical operators. Logical operators are truth functions, and they're also referred to as logical connectives. A logical operator is a symbol that represents a truth function in propositional logic, and it helps determine the meaning of a compound statement given the truth value of the symbol statement or statements that compose the compound statement. They're used with a simple statement or statements in order to create compound statements. Now here below, these are examples of logical operators. You have the first one, which is a tilde, and this is the logical operator that represents a negation. Then you have what is referred to as the dot, and this represents the logical operator, which is the conjunction. Then you have what is referred to as the wedge, the little V-shaped thing, and this represents the logical operator that is the disjunction. And then you have what is called the horseshoe, and this represents the logical operator of the conditional statement. And then finally you have what is called the triple bar, and this represents the logical operator of the biconditional. So these are symbols, and they're used to connect various statements into compound statements. Now, there are, in total, five logical operators that you should be concerned with. And the logical operators are as follows. So here we have the logical operator, which is the tilde. So this is the name of this logical operator. Notice that it's a symbol. It's like a little swirly line, okay? And this tilde represents the negation, okay? And the negation is used to translate any words in ordinary language like not, it is not the case that, so on and so forth, okay? Um, ordinary language that negates something being the case, okay? Then we have the dot, so if you can't see this very well, it's just a small little dot. And the name of it is the dot, okay? And this indicates the conjunction logical operator, okay? And the conjunction will be used to translate any kind of word or phrase in ordinary language, like and, also, moreover, but, etc. okay? So this will be the conjunction. Then we have the logical operator wedge, okay? Which the name is called the wedge. 
and it in this case the disjunction and it will be used to translate any word or phrases in ordinary language like or or unless okay we also have the horseshoe okay so the name of it is the horseshoe and this is the actual logical operator and this represents the conditional statement we refer to as the material conditional statement and it's used to actually translate in ordinary language phrases like if then as well as only if, okay? So if then represents one logical operator, which is the conditional, okay? And only if represents one logical operator, which is also the conditional, okay? So it's not like you have two logical operators here. You have two words, but you actually have one logical operator, okay? Then finally, you have the triple bar. So the triple bar, the name is triple bar, it represents the biconditional logical operator, and it's used to translate phrases in ordinary language like if and only if, okay? Now here we have an example again of a um, statement, a compound statement in ordinary language that we translated into propositional logic, okay? So here we have the statement, Hamlet is a tragedy and Kung Fu Panda is a comedy. Now notice we've identified the simple statements that make up this compound statement. Hamlet is a tragedy, which is one simple statement. And then Kung Fu Panda is a comedy, which is another simple statement. And then we have the logical operator and, okay? So because we're using the logical operator and, we're gonna use the dot, okay? Which indicates the logical operator, which is the conjunction, okay? So here, in propositional logic, this statement becomes H dot K, okay? Why is that? Because Hamlet is a tragedy was given the capital letter H, and Kung Fu Panda is a comedy is given the capital letter K, okay? And then we use the dot to replace the and, okay? So here you have a statement. Now notice how here we don't have parentheses on the outside. Now, we can use parentheses here on the outside, but they're not necessary. Why? Because this is not an ambiguous statement, okay? We know that this logical operator, which is a dot, connects the H and the K, okay? There's no question as to the fact that this dot connects the H and the K. Now, if we weren't sure about whether or not that dot connected the H or the K, that's when we would use parentheses or brackets in order to disambiguate. The main operator defines what kind of statement that you have, okay? So there are three important factors that you need to be aware of in terms of main operators. A main operator has, as its range, the largest component or components in a compound statement, okay? Number two, it's either one of the four operators that go between statements or else the negation operator, okay? So a main operator will either be one of the four operators that go between statements or a negation, okay? And third, there can only be one main operator in a single compound statement. Now you might have many, many different operators in a single compound statement because it's quite complex, but there will always be only one main operator, okay? Now, consider these statements here, okay? So when you look at this statement here, the main operator is the negation. Why? Because the negation is that which has its range over the largest component of the compound statement. Now, the compound statement actually includes the negation. Okay, so this entire statement here, including the negation, is one compound statement, okay? Now we know that, not only is it the case that it's one compound statement, but this entire statement here, this one compound statement, can be broken up into the negation along with whatever's in the square brackets. So whatever's in the square brackets makes the largest component of the compound statement which includes the negation. And that negation tells us that the entire thing inside the square brackets is being negated, okay? Which means that that negation has its range over the entire thing that is inside the square bracket, which is the largest component of the statement that is the negation, okay? So this is a negation. Now consider this one here. And this you have a conjunction as the main operator, 
okay? And we know that the conjunction is the main operator here because the two largest units in this entire statement, okay, that's being pulled together is this here, the compound statement that's in this parentheses, and this here, another compound statement in the parentheses, and it's being pulled together by the disjunctive dot, okay? So the disjunctive dot has its range over the two largest components, this one here and this one here, of this entire statement, okay? And it is a conjunction, okay? Here we have the main operator being the disjunction, okay? And notice here we also have two main components of this entire statement, okay, which includes the disjunction. On this side of the disjunctive wedge, we have the P, that's one of the large components that makes up this entire complex compound statement. Then we have everything in here in the square brackets being another large component that makes up this entire statement, okay? So the two largest units that are being pulled together by the main operator, which is the disjunctive wedge, is this P here, and then everything inside this, um, the square brackets, which means that the wedge ranges over the P and everything inside the square brackets, okay? So this is gonna be a disjunction. Finally, we have here the horseshoe, okay? And in this statement here, the horseshoe is gonna be the main operator because it pulls together the two largest components that make up this entire statement, which includes the horseshoe, okay? So the two largest components in this entire statement here will be, one, everything inside the square brackets here. They all make up one unit, which is one of the largest components in this statement, okay? And then you have the S over here, okay? And this horseshoe is bringing together this component okay, and the S into the larger single complex compound statement, okay? So because this is the main operator, because it ranges over the two largest components, this one and this one, it is the main operator, okay? So this being the main operator will tell us that this entire statement here is a conditional statement, okay? You also have parentheses and brackets. Parentheses and brackets are used in complex compound statements in order to make sure that there are no ambiguities in a complex compound statement. They are used in the order given by the example below, starting from the inside out, and indicate that statements are nested inside larger, more complex statements in the same order. So here you have examples of parentheses and brackets. And the first of these that you will use whenever you need to disambiguate the meaning of a statement is the inside parentheses, okay? So these are like the regular parentheses. Then, after you have used the inside parentheses, um, you will use the square brackets, okay? And this is if you have one statement that needs more than one parentheses or brackets to disambiguate. So you'll use the parentheses first, then the square brackets, then the squiggly brackets, and then these kind of pointy brackets. Okay? Now, it's not only the case that you use them in this inside-out order, but it's also the case that what is inside the parentheses would be the smallest unit of that statement other than the simple statement that makes up whatever is inside those parentheses. And then you have whatever is inside these brackets, that's the second larger units, okay, which contain whatever is inside those parentheses. Then you have the squiggly brackets, which is the third largest unit, which contain whatever is inside the brackets as well as what's inside the parentheses. And then finally you have these pointy brackets, okay, which contain whatever is inside the squiggly brackets, and then the square brackets and the parentheses, okay? So these are in essence showing you how statements are nested inside of other statements. So here's an example here of a a statement in propositional logic, which I can actually illustrate what I mean when I what I said here, okay? So here you have a statement, and notice that what this statement is is actually negation. How do we know that? Because we have the squirrely bracket here and the squirrely bracket here, which tells us that everything inside here is one statement, okay? 
Then we have the negation outside of the squirrely bracket, which tells us that this negation is the main operator for this entire statement. Okay, and that defines basically what kind of statement this is. You see that you have simple statements. Remember, capital letters stand for simple statements in propositional logic. Okay, so you have the simple statement P that's connected with the wedge Q to make up this larger statement that is a disjunction and indicated or bounded by the parentheses. Okay, then this unit here, okay, is connected with the conditional operator for Q with a T in order to make the even larger statement, which is now a conditional statement, okay? Then this statement here, which is inside the, the square brackets, is connected with the conjunction operator to this statement here, which is a biconditional, okay? And this statement we know is made up of the simple statement U and the simple statement Q along with the logical operator by conditional, okay? And this is bounded by the parentheses here. So we have here nested statements. We have smaller statements that make up larger statements that make up larger statements, okay? And finally, we have the negation on the outside. So this is actually a negation, okay? Um, if that was a little confusing for you, just to let you know, as we continue on, things should get a little bit more clear, okay? Okay, another thing that statements in propositional logic have are truth values, okay? So the property of being true or false, these are truth values, and all statements have these properties, okay? So every statement in propositional logic, if it is a statement, it will have a truth value. It will be either true or false. Finally, we have statement variables and statement forms. Now, we're not going to be using statement variables as much, but it's good for you to understand what statement variables are because your book uses statement variables. So, statement variable is a lowercase letter of the alphabet, and it can stand for any statement, simple or complex. So, here we have lowercase letters, and unlike propositional variables, which stand for a specific statement, Statement variables actually can stand in for any statement. When you see statement variables, what you should understand them as is representing a place where any statement can go into. A statement form is a pattern of statement variables and logical operators. It illustrates the structure of a statement in propositional logic. So, Remember how in syllogistic logic we had statement forms like all S R P, some S R P, some S R not P, and no S R P. Okay, so these were statement forms in syllogistic logic. Statement forms in propositional logic, however, look something like this, right? They don't all look like this, but this is one example of a statement form. So here you have what is another negation, okay, and you have a negation on this outside of the parentheses, okay, which indicates that this entire thing that's inside the parentheses is being negated, okay? And what's inside the parentheses is a disjunction, okay? So you have P wedge Q, that's the disjunction, and here you have statement variables being used, okay? So they're not actual statements. So P and Q doesn't stand for actual statements in this case because they're lowercase letters. What they stand for is any statement, okay? So here you can replace P with any statement, and you can replace Q with any statement, and you would always have a negation, okay? So this gives you the form or the structure of a statement in propositional logic. So remember that we said that what we're going to do in propositional logic is to translate ordinary language into propositional logic. And propositional logic only contains symbols in its language. So we're going to translate just regular sentences in ordinary language all into symbols. And here's an example of how we might do so. So we have an example of a statement in ordinary language here, it's not the case that apples are tomatoes or oranges, okay? Now when we want to turn this into a statement in propositional logic, what we want to do first is to identify the simple statements that make up this compound statement, okay? So here we have apples are tomatoes, that's one simple statement, and here we have O for oranges, 
Okay? However, oranges stands for a simple statement, and that simple statement is apples are oranges. Okay? So we're going to give this simple statement, apples are tomatoes, propositional variable T, and it's a capital T. And we're going to give this statement, apples are oranges, the capital letter O as its propositional variable. Okay? Then what we want to do is also identify the logical operators that make up these statements. Okay? Here we have OR as um, indicating the disjunction operator. So we're going to replace that OR with the wedge symbol. Okay? And this OR is bringing together the two statements, apples are tomatoes and apples are oranges. Okay? So we're going to use the parentheses here okay, in order to indicate that the OR is bringing together only these two simple statements, apples are tomatoes and apples are oranges, okay? And then we notice how there's a negation here, okay, a not. So this not indicates the logical operator that's a negation, so we're going to replace that not with a negation. And this not is negating everything that is the disjunction, okay? It's negating the entire statement, which is now a compound, apples are tomatoes or apples are oranges, okay? So this negation is going to go outside of this parentheses because according to this statement here, okay, what's not the case is the entire disjunction that apples are tomatoes or apples are oranges, okay? So this statement then gets translated into propositional logic as tilde, parentheses, capital T, wedge, O, parentheses, okay? So this is the equivalent of this statement here in propositional logic. So here we have another statement, and that statement is, it's not the case that apples are fruit or have seeds, okay? And we're going to want to translate this into propositional logic. So again, the first step is to identify the simple statements that make up this compound statement, okay? So the compound statement is made up of two simple statements. The first is, apples are fruit, okay? And we're going to give this statement, this specific simple statement, the propositional variable capital F, okay? So F stands for the specific statement, apples are fruit, okay? This compound statement is also made up of the simple statement, apples have seeds. Now you see here it's have seeds, but this statement here, or this part, actually represents the simple statement, apples have seeds, okay? So we're going to give that simple statement, apples have seeds, the propositional variable, capital letter S, okay? So capital letter S will stand for apples have seeds. Now, after we've identified the simple statements that make up this compound statement, what we want to do is go ahead and identify the logical operators, okay? So here again, we have the disjunction, okay? And this disjunction, which is indicated by the or word, okay, will be replaced with the wedge, okay? And also, the disjunction brings together the two simple statements, apples are fruit, and the simple statement, apples have seeds, okay? So, we're going to go ahead and bring together the statement, apples are fruit, with the disjunction, which is the wedge, with the simple statement, apples have seeds, and we're going to indicate that this makes one unit by the use of parentheses, okay? Then, notice here, you have the negation again, okay? So you have a not indicating a negation, so we're going to replace that with the tilde, okay? And this negation is negating the entire statement that is the disjunction, which is inside the parentheses, okay? So we're going to indicate that this negation is negating everything that's inside the parentheses by putting the negation on the outside, okay? So here you have tilde, parentheses, capital F, wedge, capital S, parentheses. And this is basically the statement, it's not the case that apples are fruit or have seeds, written in propositional logic, okay? Now, here we have truth values of these statements, right? So here you have the statement, it's not the case that apples are tomatoes or oranges. And this is actually true, okay? So it's actually true that it's not the case that apples are tomatoes or oranges. So this statement is true, okay? It has the truth value true. 
In this statement here, however, which was our second statement, it's not the case that apples are fruit or have seeds is actually false. Notice, however, regardless of whether or not this statement here is true and this statement here is false, these two statements actually have the same statement form, okay? And the form is this. This is a pattern of a statement, okay? It's not an actual statement, however, so it doesn't have a truth value, okay? Why is it not an actual statement? Because what's in here are statement variables, not actual statements. Okay? Here, the T and the O, as well as the F and the S, actually stand for actual simple statements. But the A and the B here do not stand for actual simple statements. They stand for possible statements. Okay? So you can put, replace any of these here statement variables with actual statements, like T, O, F, and S. Okay? Okay, so this was just a little introduction or an example of how to do translations. Um, we're going to get into more detail now. So here's a simple statement. Today is Monday. Okay, this is a simple statement and all simple statements are given a capital letter. Okay, a propositional variable in propositional logic. So we simply represent the simple statement today is Monday with a capital letter. And in this case, we chose the capital letter M. You can actually choose any capital letter that you'd like in order to replace any simple statement. However, what you have to do is you have to make sure that when, once you've decided to use a specific capital letter for a specific simple statement, you have to use that capital letter for the same simple statement over and over again consistently throughout the same passage. Okay, so here we have another simple statement. Gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce. Okay, and here we translate it into the propositional variable G. Okay, so G stands for the simple statement, gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce. Okay, and M stands for the simple statement, today is Monday. Okay, then we have the negation. Okay. So here we have today is not Monday, okay? And this is actually a compound statement, okay? It's made up of the simple statement today is Monday, which is M, along with the logical operator that is the negation, not, okay? So what we do is we simply take the simple statement, which we have given the capital letter M to, and add to it the negation, okay? And the negation will always be in front of whatever statement it is negating, okay? So because this negation is negating the simple statement M, which stands for today is Monday, okay? We put the negation in front of that statement, okay? So this here now, negation M, stands for the statement today is not Monday, okay? Here's another example. It is not the case that gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce, okay? So now here, this is made up of the simple statement, gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce, which is represented by the capital letter G, okay? Along with the logical operator, again, the negation, it is not the case that, okay? So it is not the case that has the same meaning as not. Okay, they're both negations. So what we do is we simply take the propositional variable that represents this simple statement, gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce, which is G, and we add to that the logical operator not, okay, which is indicated by it is not the case that. Okay? So we have now here tilde G as the statement in propositional logic, which has the same meaning as it is not the case that gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce, okay? Now, one interesting thing to realize about simple statements and negations is that when a simple statement has a particular truth value, let's say that today is Monday is true, then the negation of this statement, today is not Monday, will be false, okay? And here, if it's true that gold is selling at $1,000 an ounce, G is true, then the negation of this tilde G will be false, okay? Okay, now how do you translate conjunctions?
Okay, so conjunctions, you'll be looking for the word and, but, still, moreover, while, however, also, um, we have moreover again here, although, yet, nevertheless, and whereas. Okay, and there might be more um, phrases in ordinary language that indicate conjunction. Okay, now when you find these words, what you want to do is replace them with the symbol that is the dot, okay, which is the symbol that indicates the logical operator of the conjunction. So again, here we have an example. Honesty is the best policy while lying is for scoundrels. Okay? And we want to find okay, not only the logical operator here, which is while, so we're going to replace that with a dot, but also the simple statements that make this sentence up. Okay? And that is, honesty is the best policy is one simple statement, and lying is for scoundrels is another simple statement. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and replace this entire compound statement with the statement in proposition logic, H dot L. Okay? So H stands for honesty is the best policy, and L stands for lying is for scoundrels, and we connect these two statements with the logical operator, which is the dot, because we have while being used here, which indicates the conjunction. Okay. Here we have another example, honesty is the best policy, moreover, lying is for scoundrels, okay? And again, if honesty is the best policy is replaced by the propositional variable H, and lying is for scoundrels is replaced by the propositional variable L, okay? And moreover stands in for the conjunction operator, which is the dot, then we will have the exact same statement here in propositional logic. H dot L, okay? These two statements are actually two statements that have the same meaning, okay? Which is why in propositional logic, they are written exactly the same, okay? Here we have another example. Frank and Ernest teach music, okay? Now, although it might not seem to be the case, this statement is made up of two simple statements, okay? The first statement that is a simple statement is Frank teaches music, okay? And the other statement is Ernest teaches music, okay? So those two statements are brought together by the AND operator here, okay? Which indicates the logical operator of the conjunction. So we have two statements, Frank teaches music, okay? And Ernest teaches music, brought together by the logical operator, which is the conjunction, the dot. So we will replace this statement with F dot E, okay? So F stands for the simple statement, Frank teaches music, and E stands for the simple statement, Ernest teaches music, and this dot represents the conjunction, okay, which is the logical operator represented by the AND, okay? Okay, disjunctions. Disjunctions are used to translate OR unless, otherwise, and the phrase either or, okay? So these are all single words, or, unless, otherwise. And either or is actually um, two words, which constitutes a phrase. And they go together, okay? So when these go together, they're actually indicating one logical operator, which is the disjunction, okay? Just like these here are also indicating one logical operator, which is also the disjunction, okay? So here we have an example of a disjunction. Paris is a city of lights, or Big Ben is in London, okay? So this compound statement, which is a disjunction, is made up of two simple statements. One is Paris is a city of lights, and the second one is Big Ben is in London, okay? So we're going to give each of these simple statements their own propositional variables, okay? And then we're going to replace the OR with the wedge, okay? So we have P wedge B as the statement in propositional logic, okay? So P wedge B stands for Paris is a city of lights or Big Ben is in London. So this is the statement in propositional logic, okay? Now here we have another statement which is a disjunction in ordinary language and we're going to go ahead and translate this one as well into propositional logic. So here the statement is, she is either a Pisces or a Scorpio. 
And the two simple statements that make up this compound statement is she is a Pisces, so that's one simple statement, and she is a Scorpio, so that's a second simple statement, okay? And these two simple statements are brought together by the disjunction logical operator, which is indicated by the word or, okay? So we're going to replace the simple statement she is a Pisces with a propositional variable, and the statement she is a Scorpio with another propositional variable, and then replace the or with the wedge, okay? So we have the statement P wedge F, okay? And now notice how in this statement we use the capital letter P again, okay? So here P stood for Paris is the city of lights, but in this case P now stands for she is a Pisces. It's okay for us to use capital letters again as long as the statements are in separate passages, okay? So we can go ahead and um, use P all over again and give it a different term, okay? So in this case now, P stands for she is a Pisces, and S stands for she is a Scorpio, okay? And we replace the OR with the logical operator, which is the wedge, which indicates the disjunction. So here we have the statement P wedge S, which stands for she is either a Pisces or she is a Scorpio. Okay. So this statement and this statement have the same meaning, okay? Here we have a third disjunction. We will go swimming unless it rains today, okay? So here we have another compound statement that is a disjunction that is made up of two uh, simple statements. The first one is, we will go swimming, that's a simple statement, and the second one is, it rains today, okay? So we're going to replace these simple statements with their own propositional variables, and then notice how we have unless being used here, so we're going to replace the unless, which indicates a disjunction with the wedge, okay? So here we have the statement S wedge R. Now in this case, the S stands for the simple statement, we will go swimming, okay? Now here it stood for, she is a Scorpio. However, because this is a separate passage, we can use S again, okay? And S now in this passage, okay, stands for, we will go swimming, okay? Then we use the wedge in order to replace the unless, which indicates the disjunction operator. And then we have the statement R, which is, it rains today. Okay? So we have the statement S wedge R in propositional logic, which means the same thing as we will go swimming unless it rains today. Okay? Next, we have the conditional statement. Okay? Now, the conditional statement is a little bit more complicated um, for some reason because a lot of people want to split conditional statements into their individual parts, but you can't do this. So each conditional statement is a single statement. Although it has two parts, it's still a single statement. So you can't split conditional statements, okay? Now in ordinary language, you'll see the following structure of statements, which tells you it's a conditional statement. You'll see if, p, then q, where p and q are simple statements. So if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, okay? Or you'll see something like every time p, then q, so every time Socrates is human, then he is mortal, okay? Or any time P, then Q. So any time Socrates is human, then Socrates is mortal. You will also see given that P, then Q, okay? So given that Socrates is human, then Socrates is mortal, okay? Provided that P, then Q, so provided that Socrates is human, then Socrates is mortal, and P implies Q. So Socrates being human implies Socrates being mortal, okay? So these are the kinds of sentence structures that you'll see in ordinary language that indicate that they're conditional statements, okay? And when we find these kinds of conditional statements, what we'll do is we'll replace the phrases that indicate the conditional statement with a single horseshoe, okay? And usually we'll put the horseshoe in the place where the then is, okay? So the horseshoe will go here, 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 and then here in this case where implies is, okay? 
okay? Usually the horseshoe goes in between the two simple statements that it brings together, the first one being the antecedent of the conditional and the second one being the consequent, okay? But you only use one horseshoe, okay? So here's an example here. If you wash the car, then you can go to the movies. And we're going to translate this into W horseshoe M, okay? So here you have the simple statement, you wash the car, okay? And this, it will be replaced by the propositional variable W. So W stands for the simple statement, you wash the car. Then we have the simple statement, you can go to the movies. And this will be replaced by the uh, propositional variable M. So M stands for the simple statement, you can go to the movies. Then the conditional phrase, if then gets replaced by the logical operator horseshoe. And notice how we have the horseshoe where the then is, okay? So you always want to have the horseshoe facing this direction, okay? And in this position, whatever takes this position here will be the antecedent of the conditional, and whatever takes this position here will be the consequent. So if you switch the M and the W, the M will then become the antecedent, and the W will become the consequent, okay? In ordinary language cases, okay, whatever takes the position here after the if, in an if-then statement, will be the antecedent. And whatever takes the position here after the then, okay, in an if-then statement, will be the consequent. Okay? This is always going to be the case when you have the word if being used to indicate a conditional statement, except when you have the phrase only if. And we'll talk about this in the next slide. Okay? So here's another example of a conditional statement. You can go to the movies if you wash the car. Okay? Now here notice that if is being used without the then, and that's just fine in ordinary language. Okay? Now we translated this statement into, again, the same statement in propositional logic, W wedge M. This statement in propositional logic means the same thing as, if you wash the car, then you can go to the movies. The reason for that is because that's the meaning of this statement. Okay? Now notice how this has the consequent actually first. Okay, so you can go to the movies is a consequent of this conditional statement, and you wash the car is the antecedent. How do we know this? Well, where this statement occurs in this position here, after the if, tells us that you wash the car is the antecedent, which then tells us that this here is the consequent. So when we write this into the propositional logic, we want to make sure that the antecedent occurs where the antecedent is supposed to occur in front of that horseshoe, okay? And the consequent occurs where the consequent is supposed to occur, which is after the horseshoe, okay? So these two statements are actually the same exact statements um, in English, ordinary language, as well as in propositional logic, okay? They're just stated in a different form. However, in propositional logic, you state them in the same form, okay? If you switch these, the two statements will not have the same meaning, okay? So one thing that you must understand is to pay attention to where the antecedent and consequent go in a conditional statement and propositional logic, okay? Which means when you're translating conditional statements written in ordinary language, you have to properly identify the antecedent and the consequent because if you don't do so, you're going to get the propositional statement wrong, okay? Okay. So now we want to distinguish the difference between if-then statements, okay, which are the kinds of statements we were in the previous slide, and only if, okay? If-then statements as well as only if statements are both conditional statements, okay? However, where the antecedent and the consequent go in if-then statements compared to only if statements are different, okay? So here we have if then, okay, where you have the if typically precedes the antecedent of a conditional statement, okay? So whatever comes after the if, okay, is usually the antecedent, and whatever comes after the then is usually the consequent, okay? However, this is not the case with only if, okay? So with only if, if precedes the consequent of the conditional statement, okay? So with only if, 
the antecedent comes before the if and the consequent comes after the if, okay? So here we have the statement again in uh, ordinary language, okay? And we have it as an if-then statement, right? So if the light is on, then the neighbors are home, okay? And we've identified the simple statements that make up this statement. The light is on is one of them, and the neighbors are home is another one. The light is on is the antecedent because it comes before the if in an if-then statement. And the neighbors are home is the consequent because it comes after the then in an if-then statement. So because we know that this simple statement is the antecedent, and this is the consequent, and this is a conditional statement as indicated by the if-then, we're going to use a horseshoe operator. Okay, so we translate this statement into L horseshoe N, where L stands for the light is on, and N stands for the neighbors are home. Okay, so this statement in propositional logic is if the light is on, then the neighbors are home. Okay, now let's look at the statements written in ordinary language using only if. So here we have the light is on only if the neighbors are home. These are actually the same statements, they're just written differently, okay? Now, in this case, because we have only if here, the antecedent in an only if statement comes before the only if. So the light is on is actually the antecedent. And the consequent comes after the phrase only if. So the neighbors are home is the consequent, okay? Because we know that now the light is on is the antecedent and the neighbors are home is the consequent, we're going to want to make sure that we put the antecedent and the consequent in its right position when we translate it into propositional logic. So here, remember, the light is on is the antecedent and whatever takes this position here is going to be the antecedent. So the light is on takes this position, then we have the horseshoe, which replaces only if, Okay, then we have the neighbors are home, okay, which we use the propositional variable n for, okay, and this is a consequent because whatever takes this position is the consequent. So we have the light is on only if the neighbors are home. Notice how in propositional logic these are represented as exactly the same statement with exactly the same structure. Okay, that's because in reality, these two statements, even though they're written differently, are exactly the same statements and they mean exactly the same thing. Okay, here we have another example. If the neighbors are home, then the light is on. Now, this statement is actually a completely different statement compared to these two statements here. Notice how this statement is constituted by the same simple statements, the neighbors are home and the light is on. However, notice how in this statement, the neighbors are home is in the antecedent position. Unlike this statement here where the light is on is in the antecedent position, and here as well, the light is on is in the antecedent position. So in this statement, the antecedent is the neighbors are home, and the consequent is the light is on. Because of this, we want to make sure that when we translate this statement here into propositional logic, we put the neighbors are home in the antecedent position, okay? So we have now this statement in propositional logic, N horseshoe L. N represents the simple statement, the neighbors are home, and L represents the statement, the light is on. And we have the horseshoe, which is indicated by the if then, okay? But remember, we put the horseshoe in the position where the then is, okay? So we have these two statements that have the same meaning, which are L horseshoe N, and then we have this statement, which is N horseshoe L, okay? These two statements here have different meanings, okay? So this statement might have a truth condition that is different from this statement. Okay, so here we have only if the light is on, will the neighbors be home? Now here is the case that we also have a conditional statement with two simple statements that make it up. The two simple statements are, the first, the light is on, and the second, the neighbors will be home, okay? So here we have two simple statements, the light is on and the neighbors will be home, okay? And not only is that the case, we also have the phrase only if being used. 
Now remember, only if is the only exception to the rule that whatever comes after the if in a conditional statement is going to be the antecedent. For only if, whatever comes after the if is going to be the consequent. So in this case, the light is on because it comes right after the if is the consequent of the statement. And the neighbors will be home is going to be the antecedent. So we would translate this statement as N horseshoe L. Okay? So the consequent is the light is on. Okay, so that's represented by the propositional variable L. And the antecedent is the neighbors will be home. And that's represented by the propositional variable N. Okay, and again we have the horseshoe, which is placed in between the two simple statements. Because remember, logical operators, except for the negation, are connective. Okay, they connect the two statements or more, okay, together. So you always want to put the logical operator in between the statements that it connects, okay? So you have the horseshoe in the middle. So these two statements are actually the same exact statements. They mean the exact same thing, which is why in propositional logic, you write them the exact same way. And these two statements mean the exact same thing, which is why in propositional logic, you write them the exact same way, okay? Okay. Now we have the biconditional, okay? So the biconditional, we want to use the triple bar, and it's used to translate the phrase if and only if, okay? Now, if and only if actually stands for two conditional statements, okay? So here we have a conditional statement, if you eat your spinach, then you get ice cream, and you get ice cream only if you eat your spinach, okay? So here, notice we have two conditional statements, okay, where the antecedent and the consequent switch positions, okay? So here you have the antecedent, if you eat your spinach, and here you have the consequent, you get ice cream, okay? And then in this statement here, you have the antecedent, you get ice cream, okay, and the consequent, you eat your spinach, okay? So when you have a case where you have basically a conjunction of two conditional statements, okay, where the antecedent and the consequent are switched between the two conditional statements, you have what is called a biconditional. So you would translate this in propositional language as something like this, two conditional statements with a conjunction in between, okay, so this stands for if you eat your spinach, then you get ice cream, okay, and, which is this here, okay, you get ice cream only if you eat your spinach, okay. So here we have these two conditional statements, and notice how the antecedent and the consequent switch positions, okay. When you have the conjunction of these two, you actually have a biconditional, okay. So you can translate it into something like this in propositional logic, that's fine. But you can also translate it into this by conditional. And what you're suggesting here is basically that you getting ice cream is logically equivalent to you eating your spinach. So when this is true, this is also going to be true. And when this is true, this is also going to be true. When this is false, this is going to be false. And when this is false, this is going to be false, okay? Which is also the case here, okay? So you can actually translate this into this, which is actually a conjunction, not a biconditional. But when you have a conjunction of two conditional statements like this, okay, where the antecedent and the consequence switch positions, you can turn it into a biconditional. Or you can simply use a statement like this and turn it immediately into the biconditional. You eat your spinach if and only if you get ice cream, okay? So here, this actually means the exact same thing as the conjunction of the two conditional statements. Notice we have if is the first if, and then and, and, and then only if is the second only if, okay? So these actually mean the exact same thing. In this case, then, you would translate it to the biconditional using this triple bar. I standing for you get ice cream triple bar and S standing for you eat your spinach, okay? So here you have two statements written in ordinary language that mean exactly the same thing, so you can translate them using the triple bar, okay? 
However, instead of using the triple bar, you can also translate something like this using the conjunction.